Welcome to the Workforce Wellness in Times of Uncertainty webinar. This webinar is presented by the Trauma-Informed Communities Project, a collaboration between the Center for Child and Family Health and the North Carolina Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Abuse Services. We're glad that you decided to join us and hope that you find this information helpful as you develop trauma-informed practices to support your communities during COVID-19. This webinar will be presented in two parts by myself, Danielle Miraskell, and project faculty, Pam Price, Sarah Skinner, Angela Tuno, and Caitlin Donish. Terry Grant, State System of Care Coordinator at the Division of Mental Health, and Felicia Gibson, faculty at the Center for Child and Family Health have also contributed to this effort. At the end of this webinar, you will be able to describe the impact of working with children and families exposed to trauma, and identify individual and interpersonal wellness strategies to support radical healing and health. We're going to approach wellness from three different levels, individual, interpersonal, and organizational. In part one of this webinar, Pam and Sarah will discuss strategies for providers to maintain individual wellness in this uncertain time that we're living in. In part two, Angela and Caitlin will provide specific strategies for supporting interpersonal wellness. We'll cover the topic of organizational wellness in a future webinar, so stay tuned for that. Hi, I'm Pam Price, and it's a pleasure for me to join you today. I'm gonna to start us off by laying a foundation of our training, talking a little bit about building recognition and acknowledgement. Never have truer words been spoken than those by Naomi Rachel Raymond, she said, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. I don't think anyone had words more profound for child and family service system workers. We're going to go over several concepts today. Um, we're going to talk about burnout, compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress, and racism in the workplace. Let's start with reviewing burnout first. So burnout can really occur in any profession. Um, it's the result of working long hours with very little support and very few resources to help you. Symptoms of burnout include emotional exhaustion, um, a lack of job satisfaction, lots of stress and cynicism. Um, you're just exhausted by the work that you're doing. Some of the risk factors include finding a difficult balance between your professional and your personal lives, um, just feeling so overwhelmed and overstretched by all of the demands of the job itself. Um, working in a helping profession can definitely be a risk factor. And often when you experience burnout, you feel as if you have very little control over your job. Compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is the profound emotional and physical exhaustion that helping professionals and caregivers can develop over the course of their career as helpers. So it's that cost of caring for others and emotional pain. I like, when I think about this, I like to use an analogy. Um, and I usually think about uh, professional tennis players. So they have the ability to use their arms um, and their bodies in such ways that they can manipulate the balls all over um, uh, the tennis court. And they're able to do that with such grace and style, but sometimes they overuse that elbow and you hear of um, tennis elbow. Um, similar to that for our professions is compassion fatigue. Our compassion muscle, if you will, gets overused. And this overuse results in a loss of empathy, a loss of hope, and a loss of compassion for others as well as ourselves. Um, this compassion fatigue can be um, impacted um, and compounded, if you will, by moral distress. Moral distress is when um, the individual has uh, very different ideas of what should be done um, than an organization's policies or procedures. So there's that conflict and, and trying to, to balance um, what do I do as an individual versus as an employee for this company. So that moral distress can impact comp compassion fatigue. What are some warning signs that you should look out for? There are a variety and let's go over them. So mental and physical exhaustion. 
um, using poor or negative coping skills, such as excessive alcohol, excessive food, um, finding other substances to combat your stress, um, finding, trying to find comfort in those things. Uh, a disturbed sleep pattern where you're not getting restful sleep. We all know that a good positive um, day starts with a, a solid night's um, rest. Feeling numb and distanced for life, wanting to almost withdraw, if you will, kind of pull back. Feeling much less satisfied by your work. Having a moodiness, an irritability, a crabbiness, if you will. Um, those are warning signs of compassion fatigue. And lastly, just like a lot of the kiddos that we work with who might go to a school nurse and say, I've got a tummy ache or I've got a headache, those uh, physical complaints are also a warning sign of compassion fatigue. Secondary traumatic stress. Um, so NCTSN, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, defines um, STS as the emotional duress that results when an individual hears or reads about the firsthand traumatic experiences of others. For professionals who care for individuals with trauma exposure, simply hearing these stories of trauma day after day can take an emotional toll on us. So we have to be mindful. So I'm so excited that the first um, COVID presentation that we started to roll out with through the Trauma-Informed Communities Project in this cohort is one dealing with workforce wellness because acknowledgement um, and having that knowledge of secondary traumatic stress is the first step for combating it. So what might be some of the impacts, if you will, of um, uh, secondary traumatic stress on individuals? There's lots, so let's look at them just a minute. So they're broken down on this slide into four different categories. Um, avoidance, negative alterations in um, cognitions and mood, alterations in arousal and reactivity, and other. So avoidance. It's the inability or the lack of desire, if you will, um, to hear another person's traumatic story. Being able, not being able to um, be open to hearing and listening again. So deliberately avoiding um, certain individuals. Under negative alterations and thinkings and feelings, let's look at some of this just a minute. So it's a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness. Sometimes that's compounded then and you feel guilty and fearful that you're not doing what you should be doing. It's a real, um, a real shift can take place in the brain with regard to how you feel about yourself and the world. So you can't do enough. The world is always a dangerous place, things like that. Um, you begin to develop some feelings of detachment, wanting to pull back, um, being numb to what's going on around you, and again, those altered beliefs about self in the world. With regard to um, alterations in arousal and reactivity, you can experience hypervigilance, um, that feeling of being right on, you know, you're edgy all the time and you're jumpy, um, again, that disrupted sleep patterns. A lot of this people um, will often compare with uh, individuals who are experiencing PTSD. And so if you think about some of these different impacts, yes, there would certainly be that correlation. Then in the other category, feeling estranged, wanting to isolate yourself, pulling yourself away, um, but then also not feeling like you have anyone that you can talk to and who can be supportive to you chronic exhaustion and just physical ailments. Um, just that simple, almost where your body is, starts to lean over and you're just, you can just see it all throughout the body, starting at the shoulders often. Addictions, again, turning to negative coping skills. The inability to embrace complexity and diminished creativity. You know, so many of us came into this work with such um, positive and exciting and creative ways that we were going to make a difference in other people's lives and you see that begin to diminish. You, you lose any kind of um, positivity but also that ability that you had to really stop and create um, new ways of looking at things, seeing things outside of the box if you will. And then minimizing not only um, the impact that it's having on you um, but just that it can have an impact on you. Oh, I'm so strong, that could never happen to me, that kind of thing, and then minimizing it once, once the effects truly are happening to you. So let's look at some risk factors, STS risk factors. The first is gender. Um, they say that um, women are more likely to be at risk of secondary traumatic stress. Um, we are said to be more compassionate, and they believe that's part of it. Those who um, identify in um, 
groups that are marginalized, so LGBTQ plus communities, can have a higher risk factor for secondary traumatic stress. Dose of exposure. So if you have a heavy caseload with lots of traumatized clients, you're at greater risk of secondary traumatic stress. Unresolved trauma history. A lot of us come into this work um, wanting to be helpful and um, create a pathway, um, perhaps uh, to resolve some issues, not necessarily to resolve the issues that we've, we had our, or experienced ourselves, but to make sure that someone else doesn't fall um, in that pathway. And so if that trauma history has been resolved, then those folks can be amazing champions. Um, uh, some of the best foster parents I ever worked with were ones who had experienced some trauma as a child, but what made it different was they had resolved their trauma histories. If there's unresolved trauma history, that will come up again and again and will put you at greater risk for secondary traumatic stress. The next three categories, support, fewer ex um, years of experience and sense of competence. I kind of like to look at those three together and I also like to look at them backwards, if you will. So you are cocooned or you have um, a protective factor if you have greater support system, both professionally and personally. The more years or the, the more mature you are within your career, um, the more, so the more years of experience typically serves as a cocooning factor. And then a sense of competence. So if you have been well trained, if you have been taught um, about secondary traumatic stress, you know, we really encourage organizations, this needs to be secondary traumatic stress, compassion fatigue, all that needs to be on day one orientation for your staff. Um, if you have developed that training skills, that knowledge base, all of that serves as a protective factor against um, secondary traumatic stress. So then the opposite would be true. If you do not have a solid support system, if you have um, very few years in service, and if you do not have a sense of competence, in other words, you haven't been given those um, trainings that you need, then you're at greater risk of developing secondary traumatic stress. And lastly, we've talked before about negative um, and passive coping skills. So again, um, you know, relying on excessive alcohol or something like that, um, overworking, um, those kinds of things. So um, these are the risk factors that have been identified for secondary traumatic stress. This is gonna be the last slide um, that I'm going to present today. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit. Don't think that this is gonna be the last time you hear about it. We're gonna continue this conversation throughout the training. Um, but we wanted to, to start at the very beginning and recognize that secondary traumatic stress, culture, and race certainly interweave. Um, and we wanted to talk about that. So racism and oppression um, can contribute to secondary traumatic stress and compassion fatigue, especially among providers who identify um, as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So individuals from the BIPOC community may have additional vulnerabilities to secondary traumatic stress as a result of experiencing or being exposed to some of the same oppression and institutional racism with just like their clients do, or those who, with whom they're working. Um, providers of color who have a lack of feeling safe within their work environment um, can have a difficult time encouraging their clients then to feel safe within that organization or within the support that they're trying to offer. Colleagues, um, we have to be really very, very mindful about trying not to avoid racism conversations, um, even though they can be uncomfortable at times, particularly those of us in the child and family service systems, we've got to be open to topics of racism, of culture, of historical trauma. Um, we've got to set that example um, for the rest of our community. Higher caseloads um, or being asked to take on additional responsibilities. This is sometimes called the minority tax. And what we're talking about here is, um, you know, workers of color shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be responsible, if you will, for educating those of us who are very white, like myself, um, about racism. That's not their responsibility. It's, it's, it's our responsibility as a whole to learn about racism, about um, cultural identities and about historical trauma. That's, that's all of our responsibilities. It doesn't, um, that responsibility doesn't lie just on one person. 
um, I'll give you an example where it's talking about translation. So one of my previous jobs, um, we had several people in our agency who had the ability to translate and did that, but they also had their own caseloads. And so we had to be really mindful of not expecting them to drop their workload to help with ours. And so just being mindful about some of that, um, being open to being vulnerable uh, in terms of having these conversations. We all know they're hard, um, but that's kind of the beauty of it, is being able to come together and talk about it. And what can we do to enhance and make our world and our workplace better? Thank you, Pam. My name is Sarah Skinner, and I am a member of the Trauma-Informed Community Faculty. And I'm a bilingual mental health clinician and licensed clinical social work at the Center for Child and Family Health. I'm going to continue our conversation about workforce wellness and secondary traumatic stress. I'd like to also talk more about the impacts of secondary traumatic stress on the BIPOC community and how current events contribute to secondary traumatic stress. Most of the time when we read the news, we hear about the pandemic, referring to COVID-19. The reality is, is that we are experiencing many significant adversities. Some of the adversities currently facing our, ourselves as individuals and as communities are obviously COVID-19 related health concerns, but they also include, but are not limited to racism and racial trauma, workplace stress, isolation from family and friends, food insecurity, job insecurity, um, vicarious trauma through media exposure. The list goes on. Each of these stressors on their own would take their toll. However, the overlap of these adversities during the pandemic multiply and magnify the overall impact of, and the burden on the mental and physical health of individuals and communities. So uh, because these factors are compounded during a global pandemic, it's created a perfect storm for a mental health crisis. As this pandemic has progressed, we've noticed our job is not the same as it used to be. And we've begun to wonder who is looking out for the mental health of those who are trained and dedicated to support the growing needs of children and families? In many ways, mental health and family support professionals are frontline workers during this pandemic too. Let's take a closer look at the impact of racism and white supremacy on the development of secondary traumatic stress, particularly during COVID-19. Rashawn Meadows Fernandez is an award-winning uh, freelance journalist who writes extensively on sociology, health, and parenting. In a recent essay, she wrote, too often we discuss the happenings of the world, like the coronavirus pandemic and state-sanctioned violence, in a way that divorces them from the most long-standing pervasive public health crisis in our country, racism. This quote emphasizes that we can't talk about mental health and secondary traumatic stress without talking about racism and white supremacy and the roles that they play. Before we go too much further uh, about the specific experiences of BIPOC communities um, and uh, how secondary traumatic stress is manifested for them, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about racism. So when we talk about racism, we're talking about both interpersonal racism and institutional racism. When we're talking about interpersonal racism, we are talking about individuals acting upon individuals. So interpersonal racism includes biases demonstrated through the words and actions of individuals. And examples can include microaggressions, uh, harassment, exclusion, discrimination, hate or violence against others. Again, we're looking at the interpersonal individuals acting upon individuals. When we talk about racism, we're also talking about institutional racism. So institutional racism is racism and white supremacy that is baked into policies, procedures, and everyday actions of organizations. Examples can include policies and practices that determine culture, comfort level, ability to succeed, staff support, uh, income differentials, or exclusion from leadership within organizations. Again, we have another quote from Rashawn Metis Fernandez um, in which she talks a little bit about that the particular adversity experiencing by, um, experienced by BIPOC communities right now, the exposure to race-based trauma online. So as more of our world shifts to a virtual format, it's becoming increasingly important that we're prepared to address the impact of virtual racism, whether vicariously or directly, 
and its accompanying risks. There is nowhere to hide from trauma when you're a black person on the internet. Even with attempts to limit exposure for our BIPOC communities, going online can be psychologically unsafe as there is constant stories, images, videos of race-based trauma, there are articles. In addition, there's commentary and mocking memes that can make the images even more painful when the public is mocking such pain. So even just opening a browser or having a smartphone can lead to exposure to race-based trauma, to alert, pop-up stories, and notifications. However, many people point out that the internet, social media, smartphones can play an important role in dismantling white supremacy or being a tool for anti-racist action. So the internet and social media and smartphones allow us to be connected to each other, allow us to organize, to participate in anti-racist movements and to show the reality of racism through images, videos, sharing news and articles. However, the advantages that, they off that the internet offers to dismantle white supremacy have to be balanced between mental health and safety, both physical and psychological um, for members of the BIPOC community uh, who are constantly being exposed to race-based trauma online. There is really important work that's being done to consider how to protect uh, uh, BIPOC communities from the development of vicarious trauma and secondary traumatic stress online. So for example, example, Dr. Alyssa V. Richardson proposes the creation of a shadow archive in which images of race-based traumas are removed after peak circulation or after the latest events of white supremacy. Um, and then it's stored in places like museums and libraries um, uh, to prevent white supremacists and trolls from using these images to further mock, harass, or traumatize um, members of the BIPOC community. Another example of work that's being done to combat the development of secondary traumatic stress for BIPOC communities online is um, Dr. Bernicia Tynes. Uh, she was recently awarded uh, a million dollar grant to develop an app that de decreases the exposure to racial trauma online through digital literacy skills for youth to learn, okay, how do I go online and take care of myself? I'm going to talk more about ways that we as caring professionals can become aware of our warning signs for secondary traumatic stress. In this video, Laura Vander Newt-Lipsky describes when she realizes that she might be experiencing secondary traumatic stress symptoms while on a cliff in the Caribbean. I encourage you to watch this video and to share it with colleagues. I know that I have my own cliff moments, and I'm curious if you have your own. One of the first ways that we can assess for secondary traumatic stress uh, and look for our own cliff moment on an individual basis is through the simple awareness activity. Wherever you are, I want you to ask yourself some questions about your self-care practices. Please be gentle and try to avoid judging yourself. Just know that you're doing the best you can under extraordinary circumstances right now. Okay, so wherever you are in the world, I want you to ask yourself in the last week, how many times did you check in with your body about how stress was impacting you? get physical exercise, connect to your community, do something fulfilling, take time to notice your successes, reach out for help when you need it, to know or set a limit uh, in your uh, professional or personal life. In the last week, how many times did you put off something you needed for yourself to care for others? Cancel a fun or nourishing activity you had planned so you could get things done or because you were too drained? Use survival coping like drinking, drugs, or impulse shopping. Stay up too late, contributing to sleep deprivation. Or eat foods that made you feel worse the next day. My hope is that by asking ourselves these questions and by taking inventory about how we're tending to our mind, our body, and spirit, that we can consider what areas may need more nourishment um, and what we may need to feel more whole. So, as we talk more about tools that we can use to address secondary traumatic stress symptoms, let's keep in mind that secondary traumatic stress for caring professionals is an occupational hazard. And we need our own personal protective equipment to reduce our risk for secondary traumatic stress. 